uh, were they different in the way they coached on the on the front end of the stroke? Because uh, I mean, we'll we'll talk later on about your your race in the twenty twelve Olympics where you got the silver medal. But I, I remember, you know, particularly on on as you went for the line, they're very aggressive on the front end of the stroke from from Mike Style. And I wonder whether Dick is a little different to that in the way he's coaching the pickup. Well, I think both of them like the way you row has to do with the way you respond to the training. And so for Mike, like the story he'd always tell us is because all of the Canadian rowers had a lot of layback. Right. And uh, there was like a debate kind of going on at the time that like laying back has the boat m moving up and down through the water and it's not as efficient. And like, it's most important to focus on the catch. But uh, Mike's argument always was that he was just, you know, setting the rate and basically saying like you have three things here you have the rate the length and the power if you if you're at max power then you have to increase the length so hold your finishes longer than your comp competitors and you'll beat them and so that's kind of what was happening on elk lake at the time was like people were just holding the finish to move the boat faster at lower rates um and then but like when it came up in rate i always felt like the finishes were fine and normal you know once we were at race pace but we still had this like effect of making sure that we were holding on to the finishes and kind of moving the boat through the back end. And then we had a lot of calls for just like driving angle with Spracklin and swinging over and kind of feeling yeah. you know, when you swing over that, that nice rhythm there, if, if you really get everyone moving from the hips at the same time, yeah, the boat kind of like scoots out from under you and it feels like free and nice. And then uh, like everything at the catch was just about being linear, holding the angle, being loose in the shoulders, loose in the fingers. And it's like, it's, it's obviously, it can be really different, but at the same time, like there's not that many differences. And then I think with, with Dick, it's like, we're rowing so far and so long that like you end up just becoming really efficient. And like, that's what I see when I look at the Kiwi pair too, is those guys are masters yeah. of efficiency, right? Like by the end of their careers, you could tell that they would just start a race and go on their speed and that they didn't even need to try and blast off the start or anything. Cause they just knew they were more efficient than anyone else. And I think that they got that from rowing the kind of volume that Dick set out for them. And so like to, to be really efficient like that, you're kind of just putting the right amount of like weight and pressure on every single stroke and hanging and suspending off it like the right way and being lo loose in your fingers and stuff and, and clean. But I, I, uh, yeah. D does that make sense for like the technical differences? Yeah. And we, and then at the end of that race in London, like uh, I, the, the way I remember it was like Brian was calling bows down and we just had this call in the eight where, he, you know, the guy in seven seat thought of lifting it off, lifting the pressure off the guy in eight, the guy in six thought of lifting the pressure off the guy in seven. And just to build the rate, like just catching a fraction before them just to try to make the eight feel light and be quick and be, be able to go up in rate and up in speed. And like, we practiced sprinting a ton in that boat. And like, we, we loved it. We were good at it too. We had a lot of like really powerful guys that were really explosive. And we practiced our, uh, our, our sprint a lot and just like trying to lift it off each guy, making the load lighter for whoever's in front of him. And, and uh, I, I think that's kind of like maybe the effect you see when you look at that race. Yeah, yeah. What was your target for that that race um, when you went into the 2012 Olympics? Because you won a bronze medal the year before. Mm. You're up against yeah. a lot of really good crews. I mean, it's one of the closest Olympic eights race ever, I think. Yeah. So, yeah, we won a bronze the year before. And uh, then at Lucerne that year in the heats, we actually set the world record. And... Uh, we uh, we went into the final thinking like this is it we get to race the Germans now and we beat the Brits in the heat in uh, Lucerne and then in the final we're like okay we've done a full year of sprackling training we've bashed it out in pairs all winter long like we're gonna take it to these Germans and uh, we just we didn't have a great race like it, it was like oh, after, really after setting the world record in the heats it was like we felt like we were gonna get out front and get away from the Germans but both the Brits and the Germans got up on us early. And we just kind of like stayed a little tight and never got our full like push rhythm and flow the whole race. And we ended up third in Lucerne. And so then we did another great training block back in Canada. And by the time it came time for the Olympics in London, we were like, we drew the Germans in the heat and we we're like, this is it. Like, we're going to take it to them. Like we're the, we're the best eight in the world. 
you, you, you have to have yeah. that confidence when you get yeah. to Olympic. Yeah. But we rode outside of ourselves again, and we ended up like 10 seconds back. Like we were up, like we were two or three beats higher on the start than we ever were. We never got into a rhythm, and like we rode a really bad race. And Mike, that's a big distance. Yeah, oh yeah, in an eight, that's um, that's miles. And so Mike chewed us out after, and um, like basically told us we rode like school kids. And uh, like we just went out for two days and like worked on hitting 37 strokes a minute, taking the kind of strokes that we took all winter long. And um, we kind of, so in the repishage, we got our rhythm going. And like, by the time we were crossing the 1K that race, I remember being like, okay, everybody's hooked up. We're all yeah. moving together. Like, this is awesome. This is the way Nate's supposed to feel. And uh, we just like, just lost to the Brits and the reps, but we were both through to the final. And then uh, I think like, this was one of Mike's greatest calls actually was basically every time we lined up against the Germans and tried to beat them, we always like fell short and got beat by the Brits. And uh, we, so b before the race, Mike said, don't think about the Germans at all. He goes, just all you're going to do is try and beat the British. That's it. Like, wow. and if you beat the British, you'll have, you'll beat them at home and you'll have the best race of your lives. Like, that's it. If you try and beat the Germans, like y you won't and you, and you'll actually perform worse. Wow. So it, it just made sense to be like, okay, like this is a crew that we've beat before. And like, same with knowing like the Aussies, the Dutch, like let's just do something that we've done before. And uh, it's like interesting watching that race because the Brits obviously went for it. Like the Brits went for the Germans. It's yeah. Crazy. yeah. They, like they threw everything at them and like that cost them in the last bit of the race. Right. And I, I think like too, I mean, I, I, Ron Dorney as well. Right. So like there's, there's that whole effect and debate and portion of it too, but we were set on just rowing our best race and we like took away that external focus of trying to cover the Germans. And then we actually had like an amazing race in the final and that's wow. just such a good feeling. So yeah, it, it was good. Where, where does that race come in terms of the hardest races that you've ever had? Where, where does that figure? Oh, the, the hardest races are like head races. Like, <laughs> like doing, doing head of the Charles when you're out of shape is like the hardest race you could ever do. <laughs> yeah. Fair, fair point. <laughs> but uh, like that, that was, uh, as far as the performance goes, that's one of my best. Yeah, absolutely. Do you remember anything about the noise as, as you came into the grandstand? I mean, could you hear the Cox make the call? That's one of the surprising things because I'm not sure if yeah. any of the rowers could actually hear the Coxes when they came into the last 250. Yeah. Oh, Price was just screaming like full out into the mic and you could barely hear him. Like that, that was stadium rowing for sure. I'll, I'll never get to experience that again because it was, it was such a close race and it was all eights and every Coxie was just – full volume on their mic probably for the first time ever screaming being like i don't know if anyone can even hear me so yeah that yeah. was, that was I, I remember hearing him though like like I, I remember hearing him screaming what place we were in and how many strokes we had to go and like we had a pretty you know a, a automated last 500 that we'd rehearsed so many times and like you, you just you can kind of tell exactly where you are and what's happening even if it's just like loud screaming but yeah yeah, we've got a question from uh, Cam Kilty, who's watching, um, and he's asked, I, I guess you rode with Jeremiah Brown. I'm yeah. not familiar with the name. Was Jeremiah, he was the seven seat in uh, London 8. Wow. And, uh, and he, he wrote a book, uh, The Four-Year Olympian. So he was a Canadian University football player, and then uh, he basically realized that he was playing the wrong sport because he had a gigantic aerobic capacity and uh, – it wasn't doing anything for him in football. Um, so Jerry was, uh, Jerry would love it if I said this about him too. I think he was like, he was hot, hot headed. And he was like a fighter. Like you wouldn't believe. And he would challenge Mike or anyone on anything. If he didn't believe wow. he's going to help us uh, get better. And uh, that made Jerry like a very difficult person to work with, but also like a key part of a crew at the same time. So yeah, and uh, he uh, Jerry put it out there. He had uh, you know 
he, he was going for it. He, he wasn't afraid to bother anybody with what he said. And uh, he made sure that he, we were doing the best things we could all the time. So yeah, he bashed heads with Mike a few times and it was great. Like I'll remember it for forever. That's pretty cool that he's in the seventh seat. I mean, you, you rode with some fantastic, you know, Will Crowthers and, and Malcolm Howard you're talking about. W what about those, those two guys in particular? I mean, I know there's great guys in the eight, but someone like Malcolm Howard, hmm. uh, I know you've spoken about Will Crowthers because I've seen that in one of the hmm. interviews that you did before. Just, hmm. just talk us through those guys. Yeah. Well, Malcolm, uh, I mean, Malcolm came onto the scene and he was a force. And then I think he was a key part of that Beijing eight that won gold. Yeah. And, uh, when I first joined the team, Malcolm was making a push in the single and, uh, it was in 20, uh, in 2011 in Lucerne, he was still in the single, but, uh, he said, if he didn't medal at those, uh, at, at that world cup that he would come row the eight. And, uh, so he came like fourth or fifth or sixth in the single, I guess. And then he came and jo joined the eight right away. Spracklin made him the captain. And, uh, he was like our leader and he, like, I, I trusted that guy with anything. Like he knew what was best for us. And, uh, he was, uh, yeah, he, he was an absolute animal, like physiologically. And then, uh, he was great for like being the glue of the team as well too. And, uh, he has, one of the best records in eights ever. Like he won, yeah. won uh, Canadian schoolboys in high school. He won IRAs undefeated. He won the Olympics. He won the boat race. Like every single big eights race in the world wow. won them all. And I, I don't think anyone else, I mean, there, maybe there is someone else who's done that, but like he's literally <laughs> won the, the U S eights, the uh, British eights races, like the biggest eights races, the grand, the Olympics and the eight, like everything and uh, all, all different teammates, everything he's made it work with everyone. So yeah, th there's some like amazing um, Malcolm factor there that yeah. like, shouldn't be discounted. Like that guy's. Yeah. So he, he, he was awesome to row with and uh, someone I always like looked up to and still try and talk to every now and then he's super busy with two kids and um, he's doing his, uh, residency in London, Ontario. He's going to be an anesthesiologist. But uh, I was just talking to him last week about uh, his pairs race in like 2006. And so he's, uh, yeah, he, he's a legend for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, what, what about Will Crowthers? Yeah. Crowthers is great. Like he's just uh, so, uh, so positive all the time. Like no matter what, I, I don't know if that guy's ever had a, had a bad day and he's so, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so positive and optimistic, and then he's really, really skilled as well too. Like he gets in a boat and he makes it feel really, really great. And uh, he was uh, he was an awesome guy to row with. And he's in the four now, and they're going to be going to the last chance qualifier. And uh, yeah, he's he, he's a good, he's, a, he's a good guy to be in that position. Like he's gonna he's gonna. Is he stroke in the boat? Yeah, he's stroking the boat. He's stroking the boat. So he, he's got the keys to the four, and uh, it, it's good. He'll get it going. I'm just trying to rack my brains as who's going to be in the mix for that fourth qualifier. Do you, do you happen to know? Um, hmm. I, I don't want to say because I don't want to say somebody who's like not. Uh, I'm trying to remember the, the B final from the 2019 Worlds. It was yeah. who went through. I think the Dutch went through, and I think it's – I think the Germans still have to qualify the yeah. South Africans maybe. And the Austrians did well at Europeans. They did, didn't they? So uh, I don't want to, I don't want to miss anybody, but yeah, there's the Austrians, the Germans. Uh, th there's more too. I'd have to pull it up. Yeah. I mean, you must've been just thinking about qualifiers. I mean, how qualification must've been, your aim and of course you needed to finish in a certain place in the b final at the 2019 worlds to make that qualification yeah and, and the parrot was uh not coming last in the b final yeah 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 that, that was the key there and so our uh our kind of like crazy moment in that regatta was we were in the quarterfinal where the the poles hit the umpire launch oh you were in that race yeah it was it was us the romanians and the italians and uh, the first time we did the race, we beat the Romanians and uh, the Italians won. And then uh, 
we like came back to the dock and we were kind of told like you're launching again in two hours to re-row the race. And we rode right until like five strokes to the line. Cause if I'm being truthfully honest, I didn't even know what a red flag meant when an umpire held that up. And I saw them holding that up. Two, two really? feet well, I, I didn't know what was going on. I mean, I, I heard a loud noise, looked over the poles were already kind of like five or six seconds back at the thousand and they hit a launch. And like, I was like, did they just catch a crab or something? You know, like a, a I didn't really, you're just in your lane and you're rolling yeah, your race, yeah, right? Yeah. Like I, so I didn't spend much time thinking about what just happened to them. I was just focused on trying to, you know, beat the Poles. I mean, beat the uh, Italians and Romanians and like just r- row our race. And so then you see like a red flag kind of coming up in the last like 200 meters and y- you just ignore it. Like you're just rowing the race, right? Like you're not going to stop at that point. Anyways, like, and then uh, it was just so crazy. I was like, get back to the dock. You're like, you're going to re-row this quarter. I'm like what? So wow. that, that was, yeah, it was just weird because you had to come first three in your quarter to go to the, to, to still be alive for the Olympics. Right. Yeah. 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 And I thought, Ooh, wow. Like that's just, you know, what, a, what a time to have that happen really. And uh, so then they, they delayed it right till the end of the day. And uh yeah, I uh, that, that 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 made that regatta really tough. Like, whoa! Because then we had to go out, get up, do it again, and of course, like the second time around, who's flying for the first thousand meters is the Polish pair, obviously, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> we only did a nine hundred in the morning, and uh, we're gung ho gonna get it right this time. So, yeah, it was it was cool. It was good. Oh, that's that's amazing. That is. So um, there's a couple of things that I wanted to pick up on just we, we talking about earlier. And mm-hmm. I've just written that made, made a note just to ask you about them, uh, Conley. And uh, is, uh, do you use gels on these ultra long training sessions that you're, that you're uh, doing with Dick or mm-hmm. do you, do you take out food? I mean, what's, what sort of arrangement do you make to take on yeah. calories? I bring a, I bring a bottle with some uh, e-load in it. Like it's like a sports drink and uh I at halfway, like at kind of like around 80 to 90 minute mark, I'll take one quick chug. But uh, w- when we're in singles, Kai, my partner, he won't drink the whole time, even if You're the kidding. road two and a half hours long. Yeah. Why? Because he's, he's, he's fine. He says he doesn't need it. And he's, he's good to go too. Like he's holding when he's in the single and you're rowing with him. It's like, he is a man on a mission. Well, he's always a man on a mission. And like, yeah. it's, it's crazy. I'm like, don't you need to drink? And he's like, no, I'm good. And so I'm always like looking forward to that halfway quick sip. And then if it's over like 30 K, then I'll have a little gel and I'll uh, pop that kind of like right after the first two K, just so I have calories in me, like right once we've done the warm up paddle kind of, because you know, yeah, you're going to be, depleted hypoglycemic by that last uh last bit for sure like yeah if, yeah if you don't have a good rhythm and good efficiency like you're going to be in big trouble coming back out yeah. and, and what about uh pulse watches and, and do you, how often do you use them and, and how do you use them uh yeah, i used to use them a lot but uh i, I don't use them anymore at all um, oh really not on the not on the erg or in the boat no why um I just, I, I didn't find that uh, the feedback was ever valuable to me w- while I was rowing. Like if my heart rate was really high, but the boat was going well, I wouldn't, you know, slow down my effort if like this is what the boat needs right now, it's going well. And if my heart rate was really low and the speed was good and the boat was going well, I wasn't going to like hold my breath or suddenly go harder for no reason, you know, like you kind of, you just got to get in the flow with the boat and take the right technical strokes and think about the strokes you're going to take in the race really. Right. And when it comes down to it and you're in a race, you're not going to make any uh, adjustments because of your heart rate. And like, it's all just, uh, there's so much variability to it as well too, with like temperature and fatigue levels I found. So like just as soon as if it's five or 10 degrees warmer, like your heart rate is just going to be a few beats higher. I've noticed and uh i think lactate's like a better way to go and like i've done tons of lactate stuff on the erg over the years oh really i have a yeah i have a really good idea like exactly what my zone is on the erg 
What is and, your side uh, date? I try to just go like pretty much one. It's one forty two seven at eighteen or better is like split, and that's just bang on. Like as soon as I'm around like anywhere from like one forty point five to one forty two point seven split, eighteen twenty strokes a minute, I'm good to go, and like that's really good training for me. Oh, wow. And I just that's... I just try to groove that in. Wow, that's that's yeah. really interesting.